I love the design of Lantern. It's a cute little dolphin mixed with an anglerfish, and the water electric topping is unique outside of Rotom Wash, but unless you've played Pokemon Go PvP with the Lantern buff over the last few seasons, there's a decent chance that this is one of those forgotten Generation 2 Pokemon that are just kind of left in the past. Welcome back to the channel where I do Pokemon solo run content with the goal of ranking Pokemon based off of several runs where I optimize, and I follow the rules that you can find down in the description if you're interested, and if you are a returning subscriber like James Omar, uh, sit back, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and let's just cut right to the chase on this one. With this run, I went through the seven stages of grief. It felt like every corner I turned, there was just an issue. And if you aren't familiar with Lantern outside of just the design, let's start from the top. The stats, they're solid and they're balanced. It's weighted more on the special side of things. And it has a lot of HP to be pretty bulky. And unlike some other Gen 2 Pokemon, the speed isn't really that bad, which is pretty rare because lots of Johto Pokemon are just neutered in terms of their speed really low. Now you might notice in the footage, I'm fighting wild Pokemon already. And that's kind of the first red flag and overall there's going to be three pillars about lantern that's going to lead to this moment the first is the level up learn set we've seen runs like horsey crabby they start off with bubble and at 20 base power it's absolutely pathetic and it never feels good to use regardless of the pokemon water gun is locked all the way down at level 17 and the only thing between that is flail which we'll get to in time but the point is that the moves for lantern leave a lot to be desired especially at the beginning of the game the second thing is that lantern Lantern is in the slow leveling group for no good reason at all. My first thought when all of this information kind of sunk in after my initial playthrough was that someone at Game Freak must have hated this Pokemon. Seriously, they were just sitting there like throwing darts at a picture of Lantern on their wall. What unspeakable sin did this little dolphin commit to deserve this sort of burden? It's going to forever be a mystery. This level up group, it feels bad even on legendary Pokemon. And above all else, the combination of these two things, the, the level up learning set and the slow leveling group they're just going to provide the biggest challenge of the run the biggest hurdles and it just sets you off at a deficit at the very very start now the third thing we'll get to real quick is the tm and hm learn set now this feeds into my conspiracy theory about someone at game freak just hating this pokemon because it gets nothing to help it in the early game where it needs it the most look guys things like mud slap swift headbutt everything gets them but they're just absent here headbutt to me is the strangest thing it's more like let's look at a direct comparison here corsola it's a piece of coral it can use headbutt but something like a fish that's like 50 percent head can't learn it now what about things like mischievous it's a ghost have you ever been headbutt by a ghost me neither what about panko it's a sentient pinecone but this thing it's headbutting everything out there but lantern's not allowed to but at the end of the day it is what it is i'm not upset about it and we have to kind of deal with the hand we are dealt, but it feels like Lantern just gets the bare minimum. I'm sure that the one person at Game Freak that absolutely despised Lantern only begrudgingly gave it things like Surf, Return, and Hidden Power, just because every water type gets Surf, literally every Pokemon gets the other moves, but I digress. Let's move on. Now let's take a look at the first tutorial rival battle and all you need to know is one thing. Bubble, it's already really bad, but when it's resisted like it is on Chikorita, it becomes much worse. After several runs, I'd almost just conceded my fate. I really wanted to lose this battle as fast as you could possibly lose it because it can really drag along. But look on the bright side, you can paralyze it, you can use supersonic, get that 50% confusion proc damage, and then you can just slowly chip away with bubble. I do make it past here, but this one's really slow, I need to emphasize that. And this is kind of like some additional sprinkles on the toppings of the Lantern Sunday we're whipping up today. After that, I, I battle everything on the way to Violet City, and the first thing I do when I get there is go to the gym. My goal here, don't get it twisted, my friends. We're not we're not taking on Faulkner. Let's not talk about Faulkner just yet, but rather I'm going to be taking on the underling trainers. They are standard battles, but I do want to get these out of the way now because it lets me know my goals for grinding experience because, of course, Lantern's going to have to grind, and we'll get into the why and all the details of that in just a minute. Like a lot of my videos, you watch what I consider the optimized 
guys run most of the time and when I did my tests and a couple of runs I was really kind of stumped about the early game not in a sense of I didn't know what to do but questioning if it had to be this slow and spoiler alert it does now I bring that up because I tend to avoid watching other solo run videos if I plan on doing the Pokemon in the future and I guess that just comes down to how I like to play the games just outside of the whole like you're watching a video I'm making content right now just as a person I don't like to be influenced too much and I want the video to be my own but for lantern but for good old sweet precious lantern I didn't make an exception I actually peeked into Scott's video he did one where he started with a chin chow about a year ago and I wanted to see how he handled the early game see if it wasn't just me going crazy doing this early game the way I was doing it and I'm not gonna lie to you guys I'm gonna do exactly what he did today this leads us to a speed run of the Kabuto puzzle in the ruins of Alf I made a crucial error guys and I'm, I'm sorry to say I did not get the world record because I messed up the butt pieces on the bottom everyone knows and this is like a rookie mistake everyone knows putting together Kabuto's butt is really tricky but eventually I cleared my head I got it together Kabuto we put his butt on just right and let me talk about the strat why it's a little bit better what I was doing and why we even have to grind it all now first up obviously this is how Scott grinded levels in his video and it was the only part of the video I watched sorry about your retention time Scott what I was doing was I was going to the grass west of violet I was grinding there but there's a few things that slow it down there's lots of bell sprouts that can pop up you have to run away because you only have bubble and then there are some pretty mid Pokemon there like Pidgey and Growlithe now the levels can vary but for example a level 5 Pidgey will only give you like 38 39 experience and when you factor in the variance and the randomness it just became quite slow quite tedious when you consider the slow leveling group now when we do it this way we get access to unknown they'll always be level 5 they'll always give the same experience it's consistent you know exactly what you're gonna get and the only randomness here is that hidden power that they have can be random or they can just flee which is that's not really too high of a chance it's not much of an issue they also give more experience on average than the other routes since you'll see a lot of level 4 and level 5 Pidgeys and you gotta take into account the time you're wasting running from Bell Sprouts. now this I want to just say this up front this is still slow so don't think that this is some hidden magical strategy and I think likely both ways wouldn't be far off from each other but this did feel a little bit better and more importantly it felt a little bit different so this is what we're doing today and I get to talk about Kabuto but how often do you get to talk about Kabuto but now why are we doing this you might ask well the cherry on top of that delicious lantern design Dessert is Faulkner sprout tower for the moment it's off limits due to bubble and if you try to do Faulkner early he is gonna prioritize mud slap since it's super effective now you, when you combine that with bubble being so incredibly weak you get a battle where you're just destined to have six accuracy debuffs on you and while you sit there and you question your life decisions you're gonna wonder why you actually picked lantern to do a solo run on now levels they always help but the reason for these level ups today is our level 13 move flail and I have to admit I rolled my eyes at this move at first I thought it was absolute garbage just like I did with rage in the for alligator video but I have to admit something I have tremendous respect for this move now after working with it and strategizing around it and we're, we'll get to that in a second this is my favorite part about gen 2 runs seeing something using something I never used before and then coming away with this appreciation of it I love it the goal here was to get level 13 for flail but I do it in a way where I have some bubbles left and I set myself up to be injured. It's like the meme of the signs you see on the road, the billboards where it says injured, good. That's what we're going for today. Now when I hit 13, I head over to Sprout Tower just because we need experience. And you notice when I get into the first battle here, I'm starting off using Bubble. It only does about half damage, not too bad, but more importantly, it lets the Bell Sprouts hit me back with Vine Whip. Lantern loves the pain. It doesn't do a ton of damage, but it chips me down, and that's what we want, which is weird. Lantern's weird. It's a okay we're not gonna shame him so let's talk about flail for a second essentially flail is a 20 base power move if your health is over roughly 69 percent health nice looking at the chart you can see the various health thresholds that increase the damage and ultimately this is going to go up to a whopping 200 base power if you're about four percent of your health remaining here we can manipulate our health we can get into that sweet spot in the 80 base power range at 20 health and that makes flail essentially one shot everything in sprout tower outside of maybe sage lee's hoot hoot which we would dig the 
the 100 base power to do that. Doing this kills two birds with one stone. It gives me an effective way to drain my health and that lets me prepare for Faulkner, but it also gives me some scarce early game experience that I'll need down the line for Bugsy. With extra levels, we outspeed everything and strategic management of my health puts everything into a one shot range with Flail. And by the time we get through here, I'm level 14 and I think I'm finally ready to talk about the first gym. We've covered Flail, and since we carried over our health from earlier, there's no surprise that this first little Pidgey, boom, Flail one-shot right out of the gate. Now the Pidgeotto, it could be a one-shot with a lower health range on Flail. Maybe even at level 15 it would be a one-shot, but it's simply not necessary. Even when super effective, Mudslap is like bubble, it's very weak. And keep in mind that a single accuracy drop in Gen 2 just, just doesn't really affect much. So the plan works here. I can two-shot it. I shrug off the mud slap really easy. And let's get this, let's get this little lantern train rolling a little bit. And if you're like me, you might think it's absolutely absurd that an electric type had to do this much work just to get to this point, and it is. If you said, I'm going to do a playthrough with an electric Pokemon, then my first thought would be, hey, you could easily breeze past Faulkner, he's the flying gym. But here we are. And back to the footage, you might notice that I'm going right back towards Cherry Grove. What am I doing? And what I love about doing solo runs is that you learn so much from Pokemon that just aren't dealt the best hands, whether it be other crystal runs like Igglybug. Gen 1 runs like Voltorb or even the Schmeargle race that we did earlier. It forces you to kind of get creative and really learn parts of the game. Lantern keeps up this trend and I learned that the brothers or sisters that give you the held items on certain days of the week, they are available as soon as you beat the first gym. And here we are, we're going for Tuscany Tuesday. We're getting that pink bow really early. Now this is going to help out Flail. It's going to make the strat that we just use a little bit more powerful and more importantly, everybody's favorite. We get to see the pink bow and lantern much earlier than you do in other crystal videos. So that's a big bonus. Bonus. From there, this run is similar to Meganium. I'm battling most of the trainers on Route 32 because Lantern, it's cursed with that slow leveling group. But we are getting ever so closer to level 17, which is going to be pretty important. Down in Union Cave, the training continues, and on our old friend Hiker Russell, we finally get Water Gun. This isn't life changing, but I can't stress enough how bad Bubble is, so I'm just happy to be rid of it. But let's talk about Azalea Town a little bit. Earlier, we utilized Flail to great effect, I might add. And it would make a lot of sense just to re use that strategy here, but there's an unforeseen problem. When you complete the Slowpoke Well segment, Kurt is going to give you a free heal, and the solution to this was probably my favorite part of routing, and you guys can let me know if you think this was creative or not. On the second trainer to the right in Bugsy's Gym, he has a Weedle in his second slot. I knock out the Caterpie, I get to it, and it has Poison Sting. I simply spam Thunder Wave. I don't want to damage it, I want it to use Poison Sting until I get poisoned, and that's going to be our ticket to a free Bugsy battle. After that I do run forward, I take out the trainer that has a B drill just to make sure I don't accidentally have a reset and essentially I'm going to run back and forth and back and forth before Bugsy here and I'm going to get my health to where I want it to according to that flail chart we saw earlier and this just felt kind of like a first for me and it's a very competent strategy but let's kind of dive into Bugsy and see how it goes. On the first two Pokemon, it doesn't matter. I used Water Gun because I didn't want to waste Flail PP. Probably a bad idea, but I take a String Shot, and it really doesn't matter because I don't outspeed Scyther anyway. And I guess there's a Poison Sting risk on the Kakuna, but at the end of the day, they're pathetic Pokemon, some of the worst. It's not the problem for this fight, not what's interesting. Now we have Flail online, and Scyther, it moves first. It goes for Fury Cutter. Pretty weak damage. I hit for around half health. And you might think that this looks like I could miss the two-shot range, but it's second Fury Cutter cutter puts me into that next flail threshold and increases my damage and making this fight shorter than it would be just going straight water gun I thought that it was pretty cool and flail it just comes in clutch again pretty cool move Let's dive straight into that second rival fight, and this was also pretty cool for me. Ghastly, it could survive a water gun. The ranges are pretty good though. I get it here, it doesn't matter. 
And I want to try to talk about this fight without stretching the footage out too much. Notice I did use a potion after Bugsy, and this specific health range is important. Now I'm bringing up damage numbers here for this fight. Now I want you to notice that Razor Leaf crit has a max damage of 36. This means that if Bayleaf uses it, he's going to have to hit the 25% chance to crit, and then he's going to have to roll the highest possible damage for it to actually take me out. And here I'm just kind of daring the AI to use it, and if it doesn't knock me out, it puts me in that 200 power power flail range which goes to 220 with the pink bow and it makes this one a one shot now it's worth stating that meganium it can still go for poison powder it can go for reflect and it's not even close to a guaranteed fight with a strategy but i do get it here on the first try which is you know something all, you always want to see but just like meganium the toughest trials and tribulations of the run are pretty much over and since lantern isn't a grass top things are really going to quickly start to pick up afterwards we don't even have to talk about alex forest there's no headbutt sadly in our future i'm shedding a little tier right now so i quickly get to goldenrod and we can just do that usual busy work we can set ourselves up for later and you know what this includes we got to get a little fin cut for our lantern we got to get the bike buy an abra we grab kenya we hang out with our boy juggler Irwin and his level 2 voltorb he's always holding it down out here and then we can just go ahead and we can take on whitney sadly flail strategies they're pretty much dead in the run they're not needed anymore water gun does just fine but clefairy does pull the rabbit out of his hat with a light screen and it just makes this one take a little bit longer it really stalls the fight but it's really not that big of an issue. Now on Mill Tank, I am one level off about speeding, but we have Thunder Wave in our toolbox. I can set it up, now we outspeed. And it also kind of gives me that chance to stop rollout from getting too big, doing too much damage. But here in the footage, I get two full paralysis procs and it's pretty clean. Moving on, you can pick up the Magnet from Sunny on Sundays. It's on Route 37 right before Ecritic, so I picked that up, no issue there. And in town, I originally avoided the Kimono Girls until after my Lighthouse visit. Every single one of these evolutions, they know Sand Attack, and I was a little bit scared that they would just kind of spam it, but it turns out that they don't, and it's really not that bad, so I do them immediately. Not really much of an issue. The payout is massive, though. Getting access to Surf gives you Lantern's most powerful move, and with 142 effective power, we can make battles and essentially the rest of the game just much faster. To add to that, we also learn Spark during the Kimono Girl fights and that gives us just that added coverage and added power. It's only 65 base damage which isn't that bad, but when you take into account the Magnet and Stab, it is 107 effective power which is pretty good. Now it goes without saying that this is a huge buff to our overall power level and that feels pretty great after the slow start that we had to the run. From there, I'm going to hold off on rival number three. I'm going to hold off on Morty. I'm going to go ahead and go towards Olivine. I'm going to pick up that experience. I'm going to go down to the lighthouse. And this is something that I like to do for a lot of runs that just aren't top tier elite. It feels very efficient. Now keep in mind that we aren't going to be grinding much anymore outside of maybe like one spot. So I keep things to the bare minimum. And when we're done with that, we can return for our next rival fight. Now we're going to see example 52 of why you don't see rival fights that deep into generation 2 videos. The previous fight and Bayleaf's Razor Leaf, it made it pretty difficult, but in the short time since, we've really upgraded. So much so that I'm pretty sure that this thing could go straight Razor Leaf, crit every single time, and would still be okay. To top that off, we can even use the resisted serve just to three shot it, and there's no huge surprises here. This is just kind of how the rival goes in Pokemon Crystal, and everybody just wave goodbye to the rival because he's obsolete now, there's no need to show him anymore. We can take it straight to Morty, and I'm not really scared of this fight, but I did equip the Mint Berry just in case Hypnosis were to connect. It would waste some time. Overall, Surf is going to put in work here just like it's going to do for the rest of the run, but the Gengar can survive. And that means it is going to connect with the Hypnosis, but the Mint Berry nullifies that. It saves me some precious turns, saves a little bit of time, like I said earlier, and we can just close this one out pretty clean. Now we've kind of come to that point in crystal solo runs where you have some variance in what you want to do. The first is that if you make it to the rival and Morty immediately take them on right after you get Whitney's badge, that sets you up for the fastest possible route where you can just immediately go for Chuck. But since we opted to get the Mint Berry earlier and take on the Lighthouse for that extra experience, I have another opportunity just to do another part of the game out of order. And this is going to be nothing new. I do this quite a bit. We still need to get the Chuck, but I think just going ahead, getting to the Lake of Rage, fighting the Gyarados, picking up the hidden power and ultimately just kind of chewing through the rocket hideout segment it's just something that feels good to me because if you're gonna need some extra levels anyway you might as well do it on mandatory sections of the game that you have to eventually do 
And you already know there's not going to be too much to cover here. Even in the slow leveling group, I'm still over leveled. And all I can say is welcome to Johto. The leveling curve, it's all over the place, whether it be parts like this or the uh, radio tower or like the Kanto section where everything's pretty much equal to or weaker to the Elite Four. I don't really want to rant about it. We can just finish up this executive battle and we can, we can relax a little bit. Let's dip our toes in the water. This takes us to a swift swim down to Cyanwood, not Cinnabar like I usually say. Forgive me for that. And before you know it, it's time to have a little little chat with our good old buddy Chuck brother and I, I can't remember the last time primate was ever an issue even on runs like Iglybuff it was kind of whatever usually it just goes for Leer waste its time and there's no exceptions today it's it's pretty bad as for Polyrath remember we are an electric top but we cannot get that one shot range and let's take a look at the AI try to weasel its way into a win and cheat real quick it's paralyzed I get hit with a hypnosis I fall asleep it misses with a dynamic punch but it hits the next it does okay damage, but it gets the confusion proc to hit. This means when I wake up, obviously I'm going to hit myself. Chuck, he's going to hit another 50% accurate dynamic punch. It's going to take me down to red health, but ultimately, I say enough of this, enough of the theatrics. I slap Lantern a little bit out of the confusion, and I just I move on with my life. Good, good try, Chuck. You almost did it, but not quite. Not today, computer. With fly in hand, I can backtrack for some more useful items. And first up on the list is Mystic Water. Surf is just critical to the run and boosting its damage. It just makes too much sense to ignore. Other than that, there's the usual stuff. There's a couple of rare candies. There's a PP up to keep me surfing longer. And now we can kind of just clean up some loose ends as we start to inch closer to the end game. First up is Jasmine. We don't have to really say anything in here. One word, I can say one word, surf. That's about the only thing I need to say. This one's over in a blink of an eye. Now we're heading over to Price. And this is the last part of the game that we're actually going to do a lot of extra training. I'm going to pick up all five of his trainers and the reasoning was that I found myself just a level short of ranges I needed in a bit and these trainers they're pretty good experience but they are very weak to lantern. I don't know if I've expressed how good water and electric can be but just those two stab moves alone could really carry you really far. I haven't even had to use return that much and I d haven't even learned my hidden power yet so I just grind up here and at the end of the day price is waiting on us and I guess this is kind of like a demonstration we skipped showing all the battles earlier but you already know this is exactly how they went spark and surf it does the job and overall lanterns topping makes this a it makes a normally easy fight even easier that puts us at seven badges and i think we already know what time it is we get that dreaded phone call i hear my phone ring and i already know it's him he's telling us the rockets have somehow taken over the biggest building in the biggest city but lance who was just willing to hyper beam random people 10 minutes ago he's nowhere to be seen seriously i'm gonna go on a tangent here if this if pokemon was real and i wasn't even a trainer i just had some casual pokemon i bet that i would have higher level pokemon than some of the team rocket grunts do in this section i bet if you went to walmart they would sell level 20 zubats and eradicates it's pathetic i'm tripping over my words here like this is a scripted event that triggers when you are one badge away from the elite four what was the point of the decision to make you fight mid level 20 pokemon like 37 times in a row at this stage in the game i don't want to get heated and we're going to skip over this with the magic of video editing but in my opinion it seems like they maybe wanted to imitate Silph Co from the first game which is a solid idea but they also thought that they would put these Pokemon around Whitney's level instead of the level of the battles you've been doing for the last bit it's just weird I don't always talk about it but it's weird and it's time to move on with our life after that it's time for vitamins I buy a lot here including two proteins four calciums and four carbos if you are new to my crystal runs you know that I well you probably don't know that I stop my time at blue so my run is optimized for the fastest time up to that point then we take on red without curse since it's banned and if you were to time this run on red I think you would likely have to do a lot more training and you would have to save all your money because red forces you to hoard all of your resources but we'll get back to that when we make it to the red but what's important what you need to know now is that we're getting a lot of vitamins today before we go to the final gym it's time to learn hidden power and I haven't talked about it up to this point my DBs are set up for the ice hidden power and if you ever wonder what kind I'm using at the very start of the run you can just look over on the sidebar it'll tell you the color in the background will tell you I guess I should say now I was supposed to be level 45 for Claire but I missed a battle somewhere so we're going into her at level 45 let's see if that makes a difference or not 
45 was very important for ranges and you can see immediately I barely miss a range. I get hit with a thunder wave and things are going to be much slower than they should have been, but we do take it out and let's see what lantern's made of. I do hit 45 and I get the opportunity to learn takedown and let me just go on record. I'm going to say takedown is one of the worst moves in the game. I despise this move. I think it's really bad. I'm never going to use it. So no thanks. Keep, keep takedown for yourself game. And this is where lantern's going to get some praise from me. It's really bulky and it can just take hits extremely well. Even if I go second, maybe miss a turn, take multiple moves, I'm still in the green health by the time I take out the other two Dragonairs, but Kingdra is last, and this is going to be the real test. It wastes no time, it immediately lets that hyper beam loose, and look at this little fishy boy tank it like a champion. It looks like it would probably take multiple hyper beams, but I do crit on the next spark, it has to recharge, and that means I take the battle. At the end of the day, there were some slight miscalculations, and that caused this battle to be a little bit slow, but for for all the problems I have with how this Pokemon was implemented, it is resilient and I always like to see that. Before I head over to the Elite Four, I do have to do some preparation. This run hasn't been the fastest, but it has been clean and I want to keep it smooth. I need to grab some more rare candies here. There's a real quick one that you can grab in the World Islands, and then after that you can go up to Mount Mortar, go up the Waterfall, and you can get the last one. It's pretty quick as well. Then I grab the last rare candy east of Newbark before I make my trek over to Victory Road. As for the way there, there's nothing extra. There's there's not anything really worth looking at, including the final rival fight. And the only thing worth mentioning is that I have seven rare candies. I'm going to use all of them to get up to level 54. 53 was the original goal, but I messed up my experience earlier, so it is what it is. Remember, anyone timing their runs at red, they'd be forced to hoard all their resources. I know I just said that, but I just I hate that playstyle where you're just hoarding everything because red's level 100. And what I'm trying to say is that if you haven't played it this way, you haven't optimized your runs for you know feel like you can use a rare candy here for the elite four do it it feels great but let's hop let's stop talking about that let's hop into the elite four let's see how lantern does Will is up first, and pre-Candy's Lantern was off of a lot of guaranteed one-shots and ranges. This just made the fight a little bit slower, but it wasn't bad by any means. It was doable. Now, I did have to use the Never Melt Ice for Executor ranges, but the level 53 damage rounding threshold, it made this fight about as simple as it really could be. And after a clean sweep of one-shots, Lantern, he's already on to the next fight. As for Koga, the same logic applies here. The ranges just look much better at this level, and I always feel like I bring up Fortress, and it's not really any good at anything. It's just, it's really tanky. If you get poisoned early, it can stall with Protect, but outside of that, it's never really gonna be an offensive issue, but just having things be simple one-shots, uh, it's the fastest approach. Outside of the Muck that you saw go by where I saved some Surf PP and you Spark, took a few turns, this one's really simple as well, and we can just dive into the third battle. As for Bruno, I often call Hitmontop one of the the worst Pokemon in the game and I stick by that. It's awful. If you don't think so, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I can't one-shot it so it gets to dig. And remember that we haven't seen much ground damage to this point, which is one of our two weaknesses. And just look at the damage it does. Come on. And one thing I'll say about fighters from Gen 1 to Gen 2 is that the special defense really helped. I just can't get the ranges here on Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan, which means I start to take some chip damage multiple times. And by the time I take out the Onyx with a single surf, my champ comes in and I'm really not in a comfortable position. Just like the rest of the fighters, I can't one-shot it, and it hits me with a massive cross chop that it doesn't even crit, but it brings Lantern to its knees, but the fish is just too bulky. I survive with 9 health, and I'm able to cap off this one as well. Fourth up is Karen, and we always like to see if a Pokemon can one-shot the extremely tanky Umbreon. It's only happened like once, but I think it's pretty clear that Lantern's not an offensive powerhouse at this point, but it at least gets it to a two-shot range. I take a sand attack for my troubles, and now let's take a look at the rest of the fight. On Vileplume, I open with Hidden Power Ice. I miss. It goes for Stump Spore. It misses, and from there, I'm able to hit for massive damage. Karen decides to go for a Petal Dance for some chip damage, and I take it out in the following turn. Gigar's next. I miss my opening move. Um Unfortunate. It goes for Curse, but with the Accuracy debuff, I welcome it taking itself to half health willingly, since I know that I can just sweep the remaining Pokemon anyway, so the only question now is if I'll hit my moves. I hit Spark on the very feral Murkrow for a clean one-shot, and at the very end is Houndoom. It does not want the smoke from a Surf. It gets its wish. I do miss. I do take some Curse damage. I get hit with a Crunch. I'm getting a little bit low, but Lantern, he looks ahead. He focuses up. He lines up the Surf, and this one ends in a Tidal Wave with only one more more challenge left. 
as for the champion, there's no need for an intro today. Lantern, he's just, he's tailor-made to destroy Lance's entire life. It begins with a spark to disintegrate the Gyarados. And from there, he's going to send in not one, not two, back to back to back Dragonites. And with hidden power ice Lantern, he's just kind of yawning. The double super effective damage is slicing through them. And in the very back, he's trying to hide two Pokemon that are weak to surf. And I think you know what that means. Lantern, he's licking its chops. He's getting up on that board. And we're riding two more waves to seal the deal. And just like that, we have become the Pokemon League champion. And let me state the obvious here. Lantern is at about one hour and 13 minutes and the top runs that we've done have already clocked in the blue split. They're already in Mount Silver sniffing red. And while this shouldn't have to be said, some people just don't get what I'm about to say. Not every Pokemon is going to be a banger. Not every Pokemon is S tier. In fact, only a handful of runs out of the couple of years I've been doing content can even claim that it is. The simple fact is that most runs are going to be anywhere from above average to lower tier and, and that's okay. That's okay guys, take a deep breath. The goal here is the journey, experiencing what these runs can do and I encourage interaction. It's fine to say a Pokemon is bad, but I just want to say that there's a limit into what crosses over into toxicity and negativity. The Meganium video specifically, it had a lot of people say it was bad. It's not a bad Pokemon first of all, that's another discussion, but it's fine to have that opinion. You do you. Some people, they took it to other people's comments. That's where I'm kind of drawing the line. Now think about this. If you really liked a Pokemon and you finally seen it featured in a video, you would just be excited for it. That's just how it is. Let's say you leave a comment and you're like, oh, I really love this Pokemon. And while it's not the best, I had a lot of fun watching this. And then the fun police comes in. Someone that just can't let that stand comes in. And they're like, no, you're wrong. This Pokemon is complete garbage. You don't like this Pokemon. Please guys, don't do that. It's obnoxious. You need to get a grip. You might have some underlying mental issues. I digress. I don't want to diagnose you. I'm not a doctor, but that's it. I just wanted to say that. Stop commenting on other people's stuff being negative. But that's Lantern's Johto split done for. We have Kanto coming up and I think we can just kind of breeze through it. Kanto is roughly 20 minutes of real life time long. It's generally very simple, so there's just a ton that we don't have to cover. But just to give you guys an idea, Lantern doesn't have to skip Surge. It doesn't even have to think twice about it. The way this battle goes is how virtually everything else is gonna go for the first seven badges. So we don't have to bloat the video anymore. I don't have to pretend that we need to cover Erica because we just simply don't. Instead, let's pick right back up in Viridian. We're a nice level 63, and let's just take a look at Blue. Just like with Lance, we kind of just have his number here. 63 is a great level for this fight. And part of the reason I was comfortable using rare candies before the Elite Four, I knew it would take me here eventually. Spark, it would take down the Pidgeot comfortably. I do fat finger a Surf on Executor, but it's going to be hard to one shot anyway. It's not likely, so it's going to be the same number of turns, even though I do crit. Alakazam can survive a return. Lantern doesn't have the best physical attack, but it does disable return, which is, it doesn't matter. We, we barely use return at all in this run. So we take it out and here, we're going to see that blue is extremely weak to lantern in the back. We have a double super effective surf for the Rhydon. You already know what's going to happen. Gyarados comes in. Oh man, spark. Woo, look at this. And then that thick puppy Arcanine, it just, it can't take a surf. It does get off an extreme speed, but lantern, that's the end. He closed off the time portion of the run really strong. With a time of 1 hour, 26 minutes, and 34 seconds on blue with zero resets, Lantern, he's not going to be setting any records today, and we'll come back to its card after red, but I think this one was pretty solid. It's crazy to me that this run was alright to me, but some comments called Meganium's run trash, and it was 7 minutes faster, but what can you do? Now there is something I want to talk about today with Lantern, and it's going to be red preparation. Remember earlier I spent a ton of money on vitamins, and I want to get two game corner TMs now, so to get this extra money, I'm going to grind the Elite Four several times. That's going to give me the levels for red in the process as well. And remember, curse is banned, so red's not going to be a free fight. I don't know why you'd want red to be a free fight, but it is what it is. We'll get to the details soon. Now, something I would like to kind of open up a discussion for is about why other runs maybe don't grind the Elite Four. Maybe I'll do a test one day, but on runs that need significant levels for red that are maybe in the slow leveling group like this, they would just benefit from a true optimized blue split with red training after, in my opinion. Think about this, and I'm going to show Elite Four footage starting with 
when it says you defeated the champion to the next time it shows you defeated the champion to illustrate a point. This is easily the best experience you can get in the game rather than maybe fighting every trainer in Johto that's level 20 or the under level trainer in Kanto. It just seems better. You can see that on times four speed, I can do a full run of the elite four front to back from, you know, you defeated the champion to the next time in less than two minutes and 40 seconds, pretty quick. And this is more of just like an observation more than anything. And since every run does use curse, it's kind of a bit of a moot point, but it's something that I think it's interesting to think about just for myself and my own personal runs. After the grind, I need to pick up some more items and we're going to start in the slow poke well. We're going to get rain dance. This is a move that I wanted to use and I tested out in the regular playthrough, but the setup and all that kind of stuff, it was just too slow. It costs too much time, but for red, it is worth using, worth talking about. Next up is the game corner. I want to pick up thunder for 5,500 coins. That's 110,000 Poké Dollars if you're wondering. Now with rain dance, thunder bypasses accuracy checks and it's extremely strong with stab. And then after that, I want to upgrade hidden power ice for the more powerful, just straight upgrade of ice beam, mainly for Venusaur. And this is going to be the basis for red. We'll go through a few builds. I'll talk about where some of them fell short, what changes we had to make. And ultimately we'll get to something that feels consistent enough if you ever wanted to do this for yourself. But with all the preamble and all the talking out of the way, I think it's time to dive into the final challenge of the run. First up is the special variant of Lantern at level 78. Pikachu is first and it's never an issue. It's always a one shot and all the battles I'll show are like that. So just don't worry about it. But this is my favorite build, but let's take a look at why it doesn't work out. As for Espeon, there's just not much it can do. We can't one shot it, but it is an easy two tap. It generally goes for Reflect or Psychic. And with the all special set, either one of those is fine. The thing does have Sand Attack, but it just really never came up for me, honestly. Third up is Venusaur and it's the Pokemon that maybe you would think initially you would be the most concerned about but you outspeed you hit with ice beam and if you're at high enough health it's going to set up sunny day this is where rain dance comes in you can cancel the sun and since it's generally going to pick solar beam right after it's going to have to charge it now rather than do it for free with the sunny weather this boosts our damage waste its turn and lets us finish it off with an ice beam everything is going great so far but if you didn't know snorlax it's a solid titanium wall for special attackers and only the elite of the elite special attackers can really deal with it i do outspeed and a rainy weather Surf does massive damage, but that's kind of where the fun ends. With 346 health and a single use of amnesia, this thing is now sitting at 382 special defense. And your damage goes from pretty decent to pathetic real quick, especially when the rain fades. With rest to recover and body slam that paralyzes me here, it's horrible. And I've said this before, but Snorlax to me is the only reason why red is so tough. Take this thing away from its team and we'll see every fight and every single run be much lower level. Let's go back into it with the same learn set at level 7 and I actually won the next attempt, but let's take a look at the attempt after where I don't get a crit on the Snorlax. This is where rest is going to come into play. Even though we could knock it out with three surfs with a good range, it's not great. And if it uses rest, you just simply cannot outpace it. And even though you can win with a special set, special is just not what you want to do going into, into red. So let's make an adjustment. This time I'm using return instead of ice beam for physical damage. You sacrifice the, the much cleaner Venusaur matchup here, but it is a three shot and honestly a solar beam doesn't really do a ton of damage especially when you get that rain dance up so it's really a non-issue just a little bit extra damage on the snorlax you can still open up with a rain charge surf for really heavy damage and it looks like this would be clean but if you do get paralyzed like i do here you can still lose so i wouldn't say this one is completely consistent either so let's swap it up one more time close out the run and sad to say the best set here seems to be without rain dance as cool as it is i still use thunder here but a classic thunderbolt ice beam with surf and return would probably be the best. On my first attempt here, I just go straight return. I kind of out bulk and outpace the Snorlax and I'm not going to show the end of the fight just yet, but you know, once you make it past the Snorlax, it's over. Just for consistency's sake, I go back in for one more fight and you can see me get paralyzed here, which was a death sentence with the other builds. But since Ice Beam made me get through Venusaur while taking no damage, Lantern, it just kind of fights its way through the paralysis and we end the fight anyway. And at the very end, the last two Pokemon, it's Charizard and Blastoise. You should use Thunderbolt here, but I'd be lying if I said hitting a thunder isn't extremely satisfying. It's so satisfying that I go for it twice. I miss, but rather than just play with my food, I just close out the battle with a surf. And I think we found the consistent build for Lantern. And that's going to wrap up the red fight. And ultimately, it's going to wrap up the game. 
As for Lantern's card, it looks like this. A high red level and its blue split would put it third from last on my tier list, but unlike something like Steelix, I actually felt like this run was pretty clean. Now keep in mind we haven't done a ton of crystal runs. The time and the level for red are high, but zero resets, it always feels good. And like I said earlier, not every run is a banger, guys, and that's okay. This was a fun experience, and that's really all I can ask for. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. If you are still around this late in the video, you're a real one. I do appreciate the support a lot. Now comment true real one down below because I get the feeling that some people are just kind of watching the little bit of the video and just commenting real one without actually listening to this. So if you see anybody saying real one, we know it's an imposter. You can call him out. You have my permission. But that's all I have for you guys. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.